folks, today something a little bit different and something really special actually. Um, the reason I'm dressed in this clobber is for the last 20 odd years or so, I've been a member of the Rural Fire Service in Queensland. And today I'm privileged enough to be at the Queensland Emergency Services Expo. Today it's been held at Sanford at the Baden Powell Park. So this expo happens a couple of times a year and it's a, it's a chance for the emergency service organisations throughout Queensland to give the public some idea as to how they can better prepare themselves for storm seasons, fire seasons, and just general problems that can happen within a community that might involve those, those services to come along and help people. So you'll see these things advertised. The next one's coming up in October. It will be held at Redcliffe and it will be massive. These things are incredible. They'll often have helicopters fly in to show demonstrations of people being winched up. Uh, if it's happening at Briarby, you'll see the surf lifesaving and the volunteer marine rescue people do their thing with their high-powered boats. They really are an incredible display. Um, some great people. You'll meet the QPS. You'll get to clamber through patrol cars. You'll meet Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. You'll clamber over fire trucks. If you get the chance, I really encourage you Attend one of these emergency services expos. You'll love it, and the kids will have a ball. I might introduce you to, uh, uh, well, what's essentially a uh, rural fire service, what we call appliance. So an appliance is another word for a vehicle. This time it's uh, a little bit different in that this is a 2011 Suzuki Jimny. Uh, this particular vehicle is what we term a support vehicle, so it's designated an 8-1 unit. So you have your, your firefighting vehicles, be they a 4-1 or a 5-1. And then we go to support vehicles and then we go to bigger things like tankers, command vehicles and the like. This one is designed to do mundane things like run food out to a fire ground for firefighters who are doing HR burns or maybe involved in wildfires. But also this particular vehicle has been put together as a reconnaissance vehicle. So we can, if we're doing a, a very large hazard reduction burn, that can be weeks or even sometimes months in the planning. So we can use this vehicle to get around a fire ground, put out signs, do mapping, GPS plotting, uh, waypoints and the like. This vehicle has been absolutely amazing in terms of its capability, its comfort for firefighters. Obviously, it's fully enclosed and it has air conditioning. That's a great thing on a 36 degree day when there's fire all around you. But the other side of this vehicle is very economical to run. It's been incredibly reliable. And perhaps more to the point, it is so manoeuvrable for our particular circumstance. In this particular circumstance, we have very, very steep terrain, lots of hills, valleys, gullies, creek crossings, rock outcrops, and that type of thing. So what I thought we'd do is just show you around the Suzuki. It's not something that you would commonly see as part of rural fire service. These days, you'll occasionally see things like side-by-side -side ATVs out there. Um, they shy away from quad bikes because they're obviously quite dangerous. But we chose to go down this line because we felt that it was it had the, the perfect combination between safe and capable, and it can get our firefighters out there. And uh, let's face it, none of us are getting any younger. And I, for one, was absolutely sick of walking up and down hills all the time. So this helps us in that regard. So in terms of the, the modifications that have been made to vehicle, we started off with a stock standard Suzuki Jimny. Uh, we've then raised the, the ride height a little bit by fitting a 50 mil lift kit under it. And we've put slightly larger tires so that we haven't gone over the engineered specification in terms of where we could go. These are a mud terrain tire. Um, not necessarily all that good on the highway, but really, really good off-road. You'll notice the good self-cleaning lugs. They're about as big as we can legally go on this type of vehicle and keep our insurance 
in check and obviously keeping good with rural fire service. As we go around the vehicle, you'll notice that we have uh, an awning. We don't do a lot of camping, guys, but it's conceivable that if we do have a big incident, if this vehicle becomes a command vehicle, we can roll the awning out and we can have the incident management team and a level one incident underneath some sort of shelter. So the awning's invaluable to us. For night time, we have LED strip lighting around the vehicle. And as you come around, you'll notice we have a toolbox on the top. This contains a chainsaw and a blower. Very, very useful items when used appropriately. And if I open up the back here, you'll find that we've made a little bit of a modification. So you'll see as we go through um, that it's not quite as, as comfy as it used to be. Uh, we've changed things around a little bit. You'll notice a lot of switch gear up the top here. Uh, these switches control the outside lights and also the power to our radio charges. We have obviously a defib unit here. This little unit down here is the auxiliary battery. Luster cones, first aid kit, knapsacks, a command pack, which involves things like maps, uh, Kestrel, so that we can read the uh, bar barometric pressure, the um, uh, humidity in the air, wind speed, temperature, that sort of stuff. Um, we also have in the box here a uh, small recovery kit, which consists of a drag chain and a snatch strap, and obviously rated bow shackles, which fit into the hitch receiver down here. So we've got a, a hitch receiver slide with the bow shackle on it. That's more about pulling logs off the fire ground than it is about pulling bigger appliances out of a bog because there's only so much you can ask of a small vehicle like this. So if I come around further, I'll bring you around to the other side. And you'll see inside the, the driver's compartment here, we have the three magic switches here. These are our air compressor, rear locker, and front locker. The vehicle's also been fitted with a, uh, a CLF1. So what this does, you'll notice as you get around the front, there is a large aerial on the bull bar, which is basically a booster for the mobile phone signal. So if you're within about 10 metres of the vehicle, your mobile phone signal is automatically boosted. We've got switch gear here for the strobe beacon on the top and also for the turnout uh, hazard flashes on the, on the front of the vehicle as well. Uh, we have a number of radios. We've got the GWN unit, which Rural Fire, Queensland Police and uh, QAS all use. And we also have a VHF radio there as well. If we come around to the front of the vehicle, you'll find, you'll notice that we do not have a winch. Now, the reason for that is, it really comes down to this, is if we've got this thing somewhere where we really need to have a winch, then perhaps we ought not to have been there in the first place. Because if there's a fire chasing us, we don't want to have to worry about winching the vehicle out of that sort of predicament in the first place. And we're not going to be winching anything that's really that much bigger than this. So we decided we didn't need to go that line. That's basically it. Uh, it is not designed to be a rock crawler. This was designed to be a reconnaissance vehicle and to safely get firefighters out onto a fire ground and back again in terms of delivering supplies out, but also in terms of doing recon work before a big fire comes through or as we're doing a hazard reduction plan. So from our perspective, it suits our needs beautifully. They do an amazing job, Suzuki. I'm sure all the Suzuki fans out there will agree with me. And I'll tell you what, in the six or so years we've had this out on the road, the amount of attention that it garners from just people who come along and say, wow, I've never seen one of those things with the stripes up the side and the Rural Fire Service badge on it. I'm here at the Sanford Emergency Services Expo. 
And I've managed to curtail Isaac. He's from one of the urban firefighting areas at Caboolture, I believe, Isaac? Uh, Morton, Bay Morton Bay Central. Morton Bay Central. Isaac's actually second generation firefighter too. I believe your dad was involved. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Mate, just keeping the, keeping the dream alive. Isaac's uh, part of the kitchen fire demonstration team. So what they do is they, they move around various parts of southeast Queensland, just showing people what kitchen fires are all about, how they get underway, uh, what sort of consequences are involved if something like this happens in your home, and what you can do in order to keep your family safe if it does happen. So, Isaac, tell me about the, the display unit itself, mate. So the display unit we've got here, uh, it's just an LPG cylinder sort of stove top, similar to a camping stove. Use it for ease of versatility. It's no different, no hotter than an electric stove or whatever. It's just easier and safer for us. Right. Uh, so what we do is just put a little bit of cooking oil in the bottom of a pot. Uh, we let it cook away. We talk about fire safety, so triple zero, ensuring that people know uh, the number to call, yep. how to extinguish a fire if they've got one. So we talk about fire blankets as well and how to use them safely, how to use fire extinguishers. We also talk about the fire uh, smoke alarm legislation, right, ensure okay. that everyone's got some smoke alarms. Yeah, for sure. Uh, while we're talking... That fire kind of cooks away, the oil cooks away and starts burning. It reaches its fire point itself. Uh, and then we go through the process on how you would approach that when you're at home. So we say, you know, you call triple zero, we isolate the heat source. Yep. Uh, and then we use the fire blanket demonstration, show people how to use the fire blanket, pull down on the tabs, protect themselves, slowly walk up to the fire, okay. and slowly place it over. Uh, and then we show what happens if you take it off. So we advise people not to take it off, right? Uh, but we will take it off and it will reignite. And then we also like to tell people that you do not put water on an oil fire. Yeah, for sure. So we do the demonstration of what happens if you put water on an oil fire. Uh, some people call it an explosion, but essentially it just it expands rapidly and the flame comes out the top of yep. the uh, kitchen sim trailer and yeah, some people are quite surprised at the effect of water. So right. we, essentially we want to show people what happens, how it happens, what to do and what not to do. Okay. So in your experience with the average kitchen fire, mate, if, if – Look, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, folks, you're going to have a fire extinguisher, you're going to have a fire blanket, you're going to have smoke alarms, and you're going to have a phone nearby. So if something does get going straight on the phone to triple zero, teach your kids how to get on the phone to triple zero as well. But Isaac, in your experience, mate, if, if those things are not present, what's their best bet? What's their safest bet then? Just get out and stay out. Get out and Call stay triple out. Call get out, stay out. We've got all the gear. We'll come in. We'll extinguish it. Right. Uh, if you don't feel safe with an extinguisher or a fire blanket, you get out. Okay. Uh, there's no point putting yourself or others at risk. Yep. Get out. We'll go in and, and do it. Right. So yeah. if the chips are on the stove, in the pot, and the oil's boiled over, and it's, it's, it's ignited, fire. don't try and carry that thing no. out. No. Don't throw it out a window. No. No. Don't put it in the sink for and heaven's don't sake. Don't put water on it. And don't put water on it. No if you want to see a big explosion, put water on it, and it won't be happy. And you won't be happy yeah. either. All right, mate. So... Number one safety thing as far as you're concerned with kitchens, how can people protect themselves and make sure that this doesn't happen in the first place? Watch your stove if you're cooking. Keep looking while you're cooking. Uh, hold a, a utensil while you're walking around the house. If you're walking around the house, have a tea towel all over the shoulder. Right. All the old-fashioned tricks to try and remind you that you are cooking because for the demonstration, we can't really smell the oil burning away. Right. Uh, it depends on the way the wind is, but you might not smell it if you're in a different room. So. Right. It's, it's remembering that you're cooking. Uh, we've got some wooden spoons that we do sometimes give out. Keep looking while you're cooking yeah, as well. Cool. So, All right. Good yeah. stuff. All right, mate. So, look, folks, if you're at an expo, if you see a big red truck there, especially if it's carrying a trailer behind it, if there's a kitchen fire demonstration happening, come along, have a look, see what the repercussions are. Have a chat to the guys like Isaac. They're really, really nice guys. They're very happy to talk to you about it. And let's keep everyone safe at home. Actually, you would have seen at the uh, Emergency Services Expo, the, uh, there was a couple of tents there. One was regarding speed on the road and the 
dangers involved in that. And the other one was a wildlife tent, which was uh, put together by the good folk from Pine Rivers Koala Care Association. So with that in mind, we thought, look, so much of our enjoyment of motor cars comes down to actually being out there on the road, getting out, seeing what this beautiful country of Australia has to, has to offer. And in doing so, we're going to encounter a lot of wildlife out there. And I thought, what better way to introduce you to an extraordinary person who I, I find so amazing that 22 years ago, I actually married her. So I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Madonna. Uh, hi, sweetheart. Madonna has been a wildlife carer now for upwards of 27 years. And there are not too many people who know more about wildlife and what to do with injured wildlife than Madonna. So I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to introduce the motoring community and also people from overseas who may be watching this, this channel who don't experience the extraordinary animals that we have in this country who are native to this area, these areas. So Madonna, what I'd like to ask you firstly is um, what got you involved in wildlife care? Well, when we first moved out to Debra, um, we had a neighbour that um, was obviously a carer. And because I've always loved animals, um, she we went to her place for dinner one night and she had all these animals there and then she said, well, you need to get your permit. And so the next day she got me involved in getting a licence and that was the start of it all. So, <laughs> so something that a lot of you will relate to is your passion for cars, obviously, People have different passions for different things. And obviously you became very, very passionate about wildlife, mm. so you went into this boots and all. Mm. Um, so from a carer's perspective, obviously a lot of the animals that you come in contact with are affected by things that happen out of, on our roads. Oh, constantly, yeah. constantly. Um, the biggest thing is in this country, if you see something dead on the road, dead is not necessarily dead because most of our animals have pouches. Right. And nine times out of ten, you can find a live baby inside the pouch, even though the mother's dead. Right. And it's really imperative that people, if they, if they can, can stop or call someone to go and check. You'll often see ones that have actually been hit that have got a spray-painted cross on them. Okay. And that means the pouch is being checked and, and if there was anything there, the baby has been rescued. So that's a, a, a registered carer, let's say, mm. has come that's along, a fairly common practice. found an animal, checked it, and said, this one is, yeah. is, is gone. Or it's male. So, okay. yeah. So there's, there's nothing in the yeah. pouch, right? So if you see an injured animal, especially wallabies, macropods, kangaroos, that sort of stuff, if they've got a cross on it and they're lying on the side of the road and it's been sprayed on, that means somebody with some qualification, some knowledge, has checked that animal and said, this is, there's nothing we can do here and there's no life in the pouch. Okay. So let's say somebody comes across an animal, which is, let's call it dead on the road, mm. and they decide to pull up. What, what advice would you give to them in that instance? Okay. Well, number one, check to see whether it's female. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it's a possum, a glider, andy coots, they all have pouches. Right. Um, if there is a baby in the pouch and it's pink, which means no fur, no eyes open, never, ever, ever pull it off the nipple. Okay. Because what happens is the babies are all born about this big, the size of a small jelly bean, and all they are, they're just a little fetus with two little stumps, and the mother actually licks a path from a cloaca up into the pouch. So this baby actually climbs all the way up into the pouch, and it's got a, quite a big mouth for its size, and it just it then goes onto the nipple. Now, what happens is that nipple swells full of milk mm -hmm. and fills the whole cavity of the baby's mouth. So if you pull that baby off the nipple, it actually gives the baby massive brain damage right. because it sucks the brain down through the soft palate. Okay. And whenever we get a baby that has a bruise like the shape of a cross on its head, mm -hmm. we know that it's been pulled off the pouch. Right. Because okay. of the force. So what's the alternative there? So they don't want to pull it straight off the pouch nope. with the best intentions in the world. Yeah. So we don't want to do that. What no. can we do instead? Okay. If it's still attached to the nipple, what you have to do. Now, what we do as carers and rescuers, we actually cut the nipple off the mother right up near the stomach. Now, what happens is it's like a long piece of hat elastic mm -hmm. and there's no blood, there's nothing. But you have to cut the nipple off because you'd want to save the baby. Sure. 
And when you do that, you put a safety pin in the end of it so the baby doesn't actually swallow the nipple. Okay. But it can ta- take actually up to up to five hours before that baby will release that nipple. Right. So it's really imperative that, that you do that. Now, a lot of people don't want to do that. Sure. So what you do is you can take the whole animal. There's 24-hour vets everywhere now. Mm-hmm. Or you call an organisation like Pine Rivers Koala Care mm-hmm. Rescue. Association, they do wildlife rescue. Um, you can call RSPCA if you can't get any um, caring groups, mm-hmm. and from there, someone c- will come out and get the animal. Okay, so folks, if you're out there, um, look, you could do a Google search on your phone. Most of us carry phones. One three hundred animal. animal. So That's the RSPCA number. Okay, so one three hundred A N I M A L animal on your phone. Uh, that'll get you through to the RSPCA, and they can then take the details of that animal, and they will get it to who then? Who does that go to? Uh, once, they, once they get the animal with the ambulance, they then actually phone carers like us. Okay. In terms of your personal safety on the road, and this is something we really need to stress, folks, you are more important than anything else. So if you do need to pull up on the side of the road, make sure that it's safe to do so. Your life is worth more than any animal out there. So once that animal comes into camp, I don't know what happens then. Well, um, I mean, like this little guy here, um, he came into care because the mum was hit just up the road from us okay. and he was in the pouch. So this is why it's really important that you check the pouches because there's there's always babies. Sure. Um, when they come into care, with the macropods, it's long-term, it's a very, very long-term prospect. It's almost two years right. before they're releasable. Yep. Um, but then you've got possums and things like that that are short, shorter term, mm-hmm. um, but okay. these ones are a big commitment. So this little one will come into care. The wildlife carer's job, their, their responsibility is to take care of that animal until it's due for release. Now, release is a big part of this. We do not have wildlife as pets. No. So t- tell me about that, Madonna. Okay. Just... A, a lot of people, when they see them at, at this size, and when he starts to hop, he'll follow me around. Mm-hmm. Now, they look really cute and cuddly and, and, you know, we should be allowed to have them as pets. They do not make good pets. Uh, I've got scars all over me from ones that I've I've read. So sure. as soon as their hormones kick in, they need to be doing what they need, what they sh- are, are designed to do, okay. which is go out and, and reproduce. Right. Um, as soon as he gets big enough, he will go into our back enclosure, and he will be with other wallabies. Um, it's imperative that they're with other wallabies because they don't know what they are. Um, you remember the case we had years ago when we had a kangaroo. And it had been reared on someone's lounge chair with their dog, with their cats. With their cats. Um, and that animal, we had her on drips and sedation and all sorts of stuff for a long time. And we didn't think she was going to make it, but she did. But that's because you don't rear them on their own. She was too stressed to, to be. Oh, she, right. she was a mess, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, she didn't know what she was. Yeah. All righty. So from a, a, a point of view of looking after that animal, of having the animal's welfare in, in in your mind, it's really important it goes to a wildlife carer because these animals are difficult to rear. They need special formula. If they're not given that formula, what sort of consequences are well, there? Well, all of our marsupials are lactose intolerant. Okay. Um, a lot of people, if they find a baby, some of them will try and keep it. Mm-hmm. And if the and most people don't know that they're lactose intolerant, they start to feed them cow's milk. With days they're dying, right? Because they are, they just cannot handle cow's milk. Okay. And we've got really specially designed formulas now by biochemists that that try and match as, as closely as we can to the mums and what they do. Right, right, okay. So look, folks, if you're out and about in the Great South East of Queensland, in any state in Australia, and in particular if you're coming from overseas. Uh, look, welcome to Australia. You will find the most amazing places out there and most incredible animals, the likes of which you've probably never seen before. But if you do find an animal injured on the side of the road and you choose to, to pull over and do what you can to help, make sure that you are safe and that your family is safe, especially if you've got kids involved in this, because they will want to get out of the car and help as well. Just be aware that there's, you know, there's likely to be traffic whizzing around too. Um, make sure that if you are able to pick that animal up, call one of those wildlife carrier numbers because to look after it yourself is incredibly hard and we really want to be able to help the animal as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure that once you've called that, that organisation, 
that they know where that animal is. So give them good directions or, if you can, stay with the animal. Mm -hmm. If it requires you picking that animal up and taking it to a vet or to a wildlife carer, make sure you don't pull that joey off the tee. It's really, really important. Um, and it, the most important thing, I suppose, is, look, we've got to be mindful of the fact that there are animals out there and that they're going to, especially these little guys, they're going to come alive as the sun starts to go down. So if it's getting dark, if, if dusk is falling, then make sure that you're just aware that there's going to be animals hopping around, especially if it's drier times of the year where the grass on the side of the roads is greener, that's where they're going to be. One other thing just before we go is um, in regard to koalas, um, if you find a dead koala and it doesn't have a joey or it's a male, it's really important that you phone the wildlife organisations mm -hmm. because what they do is they come and collect the body and they do post-mortems on them okay. to find out whether they have cystitis right. and chlamydia. So, And they take the coordinates of where the animal's found to see what the population's like there. So it's really important that those stats are, are collected. Right. So, look, thanks again, folks. Thanks for watching this section. and. Uh, Thanks for caring. So if you've got a car, if your friend, family member, whoever it is, has got a car that you'd love to see featured on the show, then right down the bottom of the screen here is where you're going to find a link to it.